Welcome to the Working Preacher Books podcast, a series focused on igniting your curiosity as a preacher and connecting you with the living word. Join me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Rolf Jacobson, along with Band at the Podcast. As we gain insights and hear stories straight from working preacher authors about proclaiming an authentic word in challenging times. In this episode, we will talk to, uh, with Lisa Thompson, author of Preaching the Headlines in the Working Preacher book series. Lisa, we are so glad that you are here on this podcast with, with us, and welcome to Working Preacher Books podcast. Thank you. So glad to be here, Ralph and Caroline. So tell us a little bit, before we get to talking about your book, tell us a little bit about what you've been up to, uh, Lisa. We know that you are a teacher and are an author and and an inspirer of many, but what, what are some other things you've been up to lately? Oh, you are very gracious. So yes, I am currently still at Vanderbilt Divinity School and teaching and hopefully inspiring and being inspired by all the good people there as we do this important work together. Honestly, I think like everyone else, trying to find a sense of play and levity in the midst of everything we've been living through. So mm -hmm. uh, all those great things, looking for ways to play more in the midst of everything uh, that's going on in the world to keep us grounded. Well, uh, Lisa, thanks for, uh, thanks for this book, <clears throat> Preaching the Headlines in the series. And uh, the, the introduction itself is beautiful um, and could be published uh, as a standalone essay on our website or somewhere else. So I just want to thank you for that. Um, and you talk about you talk about many things in the um, in in the introduction. I, I'm struck on page six and seven though. Uh, it says my approach to helping people formulate not answers but responses to the fundamental questions um, has also remained the same. And then you talk about asking better questions. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's such a um, helpful way to start to think about preaching differently is, right. is better questions. Um, so talk about your um, sort of quest to help people ask better questions. Sure. And I appreciate you bringing up that introduction. As you know, when we wind through these things of writing books, we most of us know the introduction comes last. <laughs> you mm -hmm. know, you kind of chart this thing out. And this was very much true for preaching the headlines as I sat with the project for years, but then it's coming at the cusp of the pandemic. So asking better questions for me involves a lot and it shifts a lot in preaching, including the where we think authority kind of lies in this work. And is, if the preacher is one who's supposed to bring answers to the community, or is this a space for us to interrogate together, for us to think together and believe together more faithfully? So that's one, in terms of thinking of leading people through the process, I genuinely try to help introduce people to the concept of curiosity. Let's be more curious, uh, let's assume less, let's admit that we know less in the process of discovery for the sake of preaching and trying to figure out life on the ground. And one of the things here that happened, Roth, was this, especially when we hit pandemic mode, like full on. And I, you know, it was a reality check for many of us, but I was mesmerized by the amount of people still asking, what do we say and do? And I know the issues were like palpable in different ways, but I thought, how do we maintain curiosity all the time and not mm -hmm. just in crisis mode or when we're just in crisis and recognize that people constantly live in crisis, uh, pandemic or not? So that's that was even that push and that line to say, asking better questions, but in a constant disposition of asking better questions and not having to know the answers or where they may lead or where the responses may lead. Thanks. In, in the next section, then you go on to say that my primary intention or purpose is to help you better articulate what you know to be true. Yeah. And I want to go way back in uh, our tradition uh, to set up, set up a question, which is, um, I don't know, 150 years ago, uh, uh, Carol and I are both Lutheran. Uh, there was a Lutheran who said, um, how, do you preach, um, how do you preach the Lutheran understanding of the gospel to people who don't have Luther's problem? Uh, so that is, you know, I, he was worried about he was in a world of works righteousness and and we we no longer are today but but the gospel is still the same but it's addressing different fundamental um struggles or uh 
theological crises. So how do you articulate the gospel? And then how do you then preach what you know to be true? Was what is the gospel uh, to a world that maybe doesn't have the problem that your tradition uh, mm -hmm. first formulated the gospel to meet? Mm, I, don't, I love this question. So when I'm saying uh, helping people say what they know that they know, it's a two part thing mm -hmm. here. One, there's just some common sense. Hopefully, <laughs> most of us kind of have at our core, I think created into us when we can look at something and say, oh, this feels really off. Uh, that person dying uh, prematurely feels really off to me. Mm -hmm. And I'm not quite sure how to articulate it or how to say that and why it relates to faith. But in my bones and my bones, I know this matters to me as a person of faith. So that's one part, trying to help people figure out. So we know some things just feel off or maybe they just feel right. Like this is what we should be doing. This is what I feel like the world should be about and our relationship should be about in my gut, just because human connectivity to one another, our capacity to connect, empathize, to know what it means to be human. Uh, so that's one part. So it was like in your bones of your bones, we know this to be true or we as, as we can talk about truth. And yet we're trying to find these bridges back to conversations of faith. And so in part, when I'm saying help people say what they know that they know to be true in their bones, it's that part. What we can recognize as, mm, I just know this thing. Now I want to rec I now I want to say this as a matter of faith. And so part when you talk about translating then for people who have theological crises or concerns that are not our own, the second part is that is I want people to get clear about what we mean by faith. Uh, all mm -hmm. of this language we often throw around, salvation, redemption, sin, grace, can we interrogate what we actually mean by these things so then I can build those bridges uh, more fluently or more fluently to what I know that I know or what other people are also concerned about. Uh, I hope that might attend to that exploration a little bit as you were following that line of thought in the book. Well, and I think the other th in listening to you uh, answer that question, Lisa, it it reminded me of the first line in your conclusion, mm -hmm. which uh, preaching the headlines isn't about preaching the headlines at all. It's about determining what matters most and why it matters. Yes. And then proclaiming out of that conviction for the sake of living according to those convictions. Yes. And, and so, you know, both the introduction and then those words from the conclusion, what I really heard uh, in, in this book too is, both invitation and I'll use the word empowerment, not, I mean, and, and maybe a sense of, of freedom in part for preachers that they don't have to, that preaching is not about having the answers and, and, and yet how much of our tradition has been that way. And uh, so, so engaging in conversation, but also empowering for those who hear our messages that to engage in this work of doing theology together does that that's what i really heard that just what just just really came to the surface and in, in your book i really appreciate you bringing this up and also the as you know you often forget what you wrote in a book yeah right right <laughs> so i appreciate you quoting things back to me like what was there <laughs> i wrote that i wrote that oh is it someone else wrote it I don't, even, I don't even believe that are you sure i wrote that yeah <laughs> But, but this is an important point you raise here because it, for me, the title is preaching the headlines because, you know, it was a course once and it got people in the seat, but also yeah. to say that this is about a community's work together, just as much about preacher and listener being together and listeners have questions or concerns that lie dormant within them just as much as preachers. And this is about us all taking some mutual responsibility as folk of faith mm -hmm. uh, to say, how might we live more faithfully in the world that we have based on what we claim we believe, but also interrogating that together. Um, so yes, the preacher gives up a little bit of power and I say power intentionally, not authority right there, a power as the listeners take up a bit more authority in the process in this exchange. Uh, and it's not about preaching the headlines at all. 
And part of that reason there is because I would see people sprinkle sermons, try to preach these around like a social issue sermon. And I go, yeah, but we've missed the bridge to folk of faith. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they can't quite translate it. So what if we just become discerners of life and faith together mm -hmm. uh, in a conversation with one another? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that, that sense of, um, it, it really is proposing, I think, a, a different kind of homiletic uh, that, that it, you know, it's a, it's a kind of preaching that brings people along uh, as opposed to, uh, you know, certainly opposed to attacking or blaming or, or, you know, coercing the listener into some sort of point that you that you think is really good and you should believe it or you know asking them to do something uh, and and so I think I feel like you're really starting from a different place Lisa in terms of 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 the what is the purpose of preaching and I was wondering if you could say a little bit about what what does a sermon sound like when it when it has this starting point what what is the sense of, uh, what is the experience of a sermon like this that you would say is distinctive from, and again, I'm, I'm, I'm painting with a broad brush in terms of, you know, generalizations of what people think a sermon should do or sound like or be, but in your, in your mind and in, in your imagination with this, with this really different kind of premise and starting point, what, yeah, what does a sermon sound like? Oh my goodness. I, I want to go back to just say, it can be terrifying. It can be uh -huh. terrifying for the preacher and the listener in a way. Mm -hmm. And it is the unknowing part. It, I, I really do believe the sermon in some way mirrors the sermon development process. And so I hope that we're inviting each other into a process of having an unsettling experience of sermon <laughs> development where you do not yet know where it's going, but you trust the process. So I think that's part of what the sermon even sounds like and looks like. You know, there's some enigmas at work. There's some complications at work, but we're going to trust the process of engaging this text, of engaging this moment in the world, and that we might get to the other side and there aren't going to be tidy answers uh, or, uh, or conclusions. And one of the things I did in the book, and I showed my hand, this was really difficult for me because I do not like to lift up my own sermons as examples, especially even in the classroom or to preachers, because for me, it's very important that you figure out what your preaching voice is. You figure right. out what your claim is and preaching is not just about mimicking and modeling, but how we come into self and voice. Yes, we listen to people, but we're not duplicating. But for this book, as you know, I did lift up a few of my sermons where I've kind of done this work and every last one of them have been terrifying for me. So <laughs> in terms of, so we can, especially when you think in one side as an academic, there are all sorts of things you can do in the classroom, explore theoretically, but when it comes to being responsible with, it, with people in relationship for their faith development, and not wanting to be careless, but at the same time push, uh, it's terrifying stuff. <laughs> if, you, if you don't want to fumble the ball here, if I'll use that metaphor. So for the, there's an example in there for judges. Um, there's a judge's sermon in there on Bat Jepta. And in that sermon, I'm not giving attention to Jepta at all. <laughs> there's a way in which I clearly want to reframe this for the person who's missing in the story uh, mm -hmm. or who we get a glimpse of as she goes to the altar. So for that sermon, I'm trying to reframe Jephthah as Bat Jephthah's father and not even Jephthah, <laughs> um, but figure out how to tell the story from her vantage point. Apologies, we have a lawnmower outside, <laughs> if you can hear it. Um, I can't hear it. No. It'll, it'll yeah. pass, hopefully. Okay. Um, so, but one of the things here is though that somehow there is a collapse between the worlds for me, the biblical world and the everyday world. And there's uh, easy parallels where suddenly Bot Jepta is Sandra Bland, or Bot Jepta are the Haitian refugees that just got deported. You know, so thinking about how do we make very plain the connections that we might want to make to the everyday world and reveal four dimensional characters of the text and even in the world around us. Mm -hmm. So in that regard, the sermons are terrifying, but I think they are, they hold possibility and they require the work of both preacher and listener at the same time, even in that moment. Mm -hmm. uh, I wanna follow up on 
three things <laughs> that the two of you have just been talking about. Uh, if I can remember the third one by the time I get there. So uh, yeah, on page 16, you, do, you, you say, uh, headlines is a met in, in the title is a metaphor for all those things our communities are struggling with and wondering about. I think um, a lot of times that's not politics or and, and it doesn't actually reach the headlines, even in the local newspaper. The only way I can think about how to get at those, I, I think every preacher I know wants to be they're preaching to be more relevant uh, to the lives of people, but, but they don't know how. And so it requires a, a listening that um, we're, we're really not taught, although uh, we've started to teach it in some classes at our school, uh, like how to, how to go out and really listen. Um, uh, a friend of mine recently, who's a pastor, recently st started visiting people at their places of work. And uh, he called on... Uh, twin brothers who own a company that has 60 employees here and 180 in uh, Mexico. Well, then he'd listen to them about, like you said, things he has, he knows nothing about the stresses of the labor market, uh, you know, inter, uh, international trade, because you got companies and two. So, um, and as he left, uh, uh, one of the brothers just was weeping because he'd never had a pastor visit at work in his life. Um, so that, I guess that's one way I could think about listening. Uh, and then you start to realize, I don't know anything about this guy's daily problems. Do you have uh, other ideas about listening or how to get to know what the concerns in the community are? I, I do appreciate this concept of listening and even actively listening to people and just the world around us. It was my, it was festival homiletics, must have been how many years ago, three or four years ago, where I was doing this talk around preaching the headline and my sister was attending with me and I was trying to explain it to her and she said, oh, it's where life meets the ground. That's what you're talking about. So I have to give credit to her in part for this, <laughs> for this idea of what it means, but it is about listening to the ground and keeping our hearts to the ground and to, to hear what's happening there. Yes, I love sitting with people, having coffee and recognizing what we do not know. And every time we think that we learn, every time we learn something more, we learn all the more of what we don't know. Um, so Rock, I would say, I love this idea of visiting people at work, walking the neighborhood, saying hello, being curious, uh, being a neighbor again, a person with human to human contact and figuring out how to do that. I want to say a word here, but also about protection of oneself as well. At some point stage in writing the book, I realized I had to turn the news off. At some, there, there was a stage in the middle of all that we were living through in the past, like 16 months or so, and last summer where I realized I had to unplug from the news, but then I had to go back to the book. And I thought you can't keep writing a book on preaching the headlines if you're not watching the news <laughs> every day or at least listening to something. But there are these moments though, I say that to say, we have to make decisions about when we need to self-preserve as well. Uh, because being constantly exposed uh, to all of the information and all the material at some point can induce a different state of grief or too much, or even we can even become a little callous, or it just becomes like something else is in the ear because the cycle is constantly changing. So the thing I really want to lift up is this constant movement between a posture of listening and a posture of retreat uh, to kind of restore mm. and think about what, what I've been exposed to and what I what I've experienced so I can return to listen again and listen anew uh, with a kind of a fresh heart <laughs> at, to the situation at hand. Wow, that was a, that was, that was a great answer, uh, great thoughts. Um, so the next thing, uh, my favorite thing you wrote in the book is on page 22. Oh. <laughs> and it's because, you know, I'm, I'm a Bible teacher. Uh, the most effective preaching recognizes that we are at our best. We are best able to tell the story of biblical texts anew when we listen deeply to them as stories of a world that is different from ours, yet familiar in that the people long ago lived with enigmas, power struggles, vulnerabilities, pursuits of life, failures, and successes similar to our own. Mm -hmm. um, so <laughs> how do you listen to the Bible as the stories of a world that's different from ours? I mean, in, in so, some ways throughout the book, you're talking about 
in order to do this, we have, you have to read the Bible differently. <laughs> I know as I sit here with the two Bibles. No, no, <laughs> this is. No, no yeah. No, so the problem is I teach the people to read the Bible and then they get out there and they've got to read, they got to learn to read the Bible differently than I taught them. <laughs> and I have to read the Bible differently than I've always done it. Help me. I know. I, I think about this. Well, they also get to my class when they leave your class. And I'm going, what did you learn? I know you learned it. Bring it. Yeah. <laughs> Bring it here. Uh, but it is about it is about close reading for me that mm -hmm. being willing to treat this as a new story every time, as a new experience every time. This is bedrock for me, but also being willing to read it as a story that has an entire world behind it, that these are people, these are actually people and worlds trying to make sense of each other, trying to make sense of God, trying to make sense of life with each other. So then if we can recover the human, human experience of the senses, <laughs> what do I feel? What do I taste? What do I touch? I come back to this every single time. And when I'm sitting with someone to say, what do you feel? What do you taste? What do you touch? Uh, what do you sense when you, like if, if she's really on the ground weeping, what does that look like? What does it feel mm -hmm. like? Or can we imagine Jesus extending a hand in this moment? So there is a, for me, it's very important to just sit with it and not, not go to the sermon. We don't know what the sermon will be yet. <laughs> and just have an encounter with this text. And this isn't new to me. This is kind of the thread of uh, biblical scholarship, homileticians. And so that this idea of a, a fresh encounter every time, how do we do that? And that's a posture of listening. I admit, I know this is hard in the week in, week out demands of pastoral ministry and those who are preaching week in and week out. Uh, and I'm also advocating and championing to say, still the time back, <laughs> still the mm -hmm. time back just to linger with the passage for a couple days or at least a couple walks or just have this moment where you are present to it without knowing where it's going yet. Mm -hmm. So I know I keep coming back to this theme of not knowing where the journey ends, but for me, it's very important to be curious and to ask the questions we don't always want to ask and to be angry when we want to be angry, get mad at the burning altar, like allow mm -hmm. ourselves to not try to fix it for God, not try to fix it for scripture. As far as I'm concerned, God doesn't need our help fixing anything in terms of what the text might do or what it's doing or, uh, or even uh, defending God and coming to the rescue of God or spirit when something has happened, but being willing to live into those tensions uh, and experience them. Mm -hmm. And here, uh, the last thing I'll say here is I genuinely believe we all feel these tensions, but we've been convinced that we don't feel them. So being willing to acknowledge that actually this thing is here and be curious again. Mm -hmm. Well, and to me, it what it I think what you're proposing, I mean, you're in uh, chapter, as I think it's two, is it? Yeah, chapter two, which is called Fleshy Parts. Uh, and you're asking, you're, you know, so you, you play on that with you, you're fleshing out the people and the histories present in the text and, and then recognizing that those are our histories and our realities as well. And so you ask these great questions, like get in touch with the bodily experience. But I also hear, I hear all of that too, as a, as a, a way to, recast or re-embrace what we mean by incarnational preaching, uh, taking really seriously the doctrine of the incarnation is not, not just that Jesus, it, God became human in Jesus, but that that actually affects, has an effect on how we engage with the text and how we preach that it's, that it, that's the ongoingness of the incarnation. And we tend to, we tend to, uh, uh, you know, we tend often to locate that doctrine in the past. Uh, does that does that make sense? Oh, it absolutely makes sense. And as what you picked up on, right? So I'm the our faith tradition is carnal at its core. <laughs> it is fleshy at its core, and it's the first uh -huh. thing we try to throw out the door, mm -hmm. or to make as the thing that's not important, or we don't have to recover. But I'm thinking, what if we we just lean full on in, in this, <laughs> into this? And what are the possibilities here to say, no, if God owned this, let us own it. And maybe this is something that God honors and cares about most. <laughs> uh, and it even impacts what we do with the text or this, the preaching. Well, one of the things we like to do, Lisa, I, with these podcasts is, yes, talk about the book and get people excited about the book and y'all go all y'all go get this book. 
Uh, but we also like to hear a little bit from our guests on, on aspects of preaching in general. And so, uh, I, so one question I had was, uh, and maybe I've asked it a couple of times before myself, <laughs> but what is your, uh, what is your tried and true method when you're, when you're stuck, when you're, you're, you're hitting the wall, we all know, know that place. And we're just trying to figure out like how to, how to get this sermon somewhere. And do you have a, do you have a, something you fall back on that looks like, okay, this is here, here we go. This is what I need to do to get me out of this spot. You know, there are a couple of things and I, I have to try a couple of different things every time. So one is just to take the break, walk away, mm. <laughs> walk away from it, do something that's not the sermon. That's not preaching. That's not Jesus. Is what I always say. So, and I really do believe in play as a process of sermon development, even in these times. Right. So whether it's the walk, whether it's the movie, whether it's the conversation with the friend, but I'm always talking to other people around my sermons. I really do believe I do not write sermons in so solo, even if they don't know I'm talking to them about the sermon. Uh, so that's one thing. The other thing is that my sermon writing process is like a mad scientist. I have markers, <laughs> I have tape, I have a wall that looks like a crime scene investigation where I'm cutting, I'm pasting, it is full on bodily. I'm on the floor if I can be, but trying to figure out how to get myself out of a box helps. Mm -hmm. So if that's doodling, if that's drawing what I see, sometimes I voice memo. If I can't write the thing, then I just start speaking off the cuff into my voice memo to see what comes up uh, there. And finally, when it's because at some point you got to preach, and so you can't be stuck always. And that just forces me to have to sit down and start writing free, write, Just sit down and start and see what happens and see where it goes. Because one of the things is like Sunday comes every single time, <laughs> every <laughs> single week, every single week or, or Saturday or Friday or Wednesday. And it's going, it's time. So go time is coming and you just have to put it to the page at some point. So those are my three things. Walk away, get bodily, get creative, but also just say, we're going to have to try to figure out what we can grind out right mm -hmm. here <laughs> and take the risk. Because for me, so a lot of times also it's about the risk and being willing to take the risk with the voice, the thought, the idea and see where it goes. So uh, we've all had to preach um, hard sermons. Oh. So what's the hardest sermon uh, you've ever uh, had to preach? And how'd you get through it? Oh gosh, I've had a couple of these. <laughs> uh, but one, it's it's been a long time ago. And I remember it because my mother laughed at me about this sermon because I was so angry about it. I was doing a women's conference and <laughs> and they wanted me to come preach the theme of being the tightest two woman. And I just kind of died a little inside because- <laughs> Just stop there for a second. <laughs> I don't know what that means. So I'm guessing at least one other listener doesn't. So what is the tightest two woman? Yeah, that's what I wanted to know. What is the tightest two woman? I always tell people, give me a theme or a text, but not both, please. But this time I got both. And so the tightest two woman, as on the page, appears to be at home, quiet, teaching her daughters to be quiet and uh, oh. stay in the home and all those great house code things. And, but it's followed right by, by a slave be obedient to your masters basically passage as well. So there are all of these things where I'm going, ah, in the 20th, then it was the 20th century, what are we doing here? Uh, so that is the most difficult sermon I've ever had to preach. And I almost was not going to preach it at all. I thought I can't do this, I just can't do it. And then I had to live up to actually what I believe that you can you can take on any text is how you take it on. Uh, so that's the most difficult sermon I had to preach because I know they expected something completely different as I was about to go in and dismantle this text <laughs> and, um, for our world today. And I never forget getting to a line of saying, we have to understand a world in which uh, women are only thought to be monitored and watched in their movements. And I look up and the pastor of the church is looking down from the sound booth on the sanctuary of women <laughs> as I'm saying this. And I didn't recognize that he was there, but I'm like, we're here now. So <laughs> uh, this is what we're doing. But that is one of the most, there have been several, but that's one of the most memorable uh, where usually I choose the problem, but they had given me a problem that I had to figure out 
how was I going to do this pastorally, but also say, I don't think this is what you're really after or what we're after in this moment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Lisa, one, one thing I like to ask too is where, where do you go? What do you do? What, what books or, or uh, it could, it could be books or not books, but what, what do you do uh, when you need to refill yourself spiritually when you feel like that that well is running a little bit dry and you need you need that replenishment what are, what are some of your practices or what are some of your go-to uh, resources to maybe gain a little bit of that back yeah I, I return to this, this theme of play that I started with, Carolyn, because that really is my go-to. And I, I started with play when you asked what I've been up to, because these have been seasons, these have been difficult seasons and needing wells restored constantly. But I love literary arts. And so when, if I'm going, I'm going to literature, I'm going mm -hmm. to Toni Morrison, I'm going to Octavia Butler, or I'm going to uh, new people, Jacqueline Woodson. So just to figure out I want to see worlds created in language. Mm -hmm. I want to see worlds conveyed, but I also want to be swept away in someone else's story where I'm not in control of the ride <laughs> and someone else gets to show me something beautiful or maybe it's tragic, but I get to experience someone else's ride. So that's one. And I love water. <laughs> if I can find water mm -hmm. or a quiet spot, that also kind of reconnects me, help me feel grounded again. Mm -hmm. Those are my two go-tos in terms of looking for something else. Uh, or doing something with my hands. Recently, mm -hmm. I had the opportunity to go play with a local concrete artist in mm -hmm. his studio, but it was, but I'm not in control of the process. It gave me the capacity to do something with my hands, but also get in touch with creativity, imagination, everything that's holy in a different way. Love that. Hmm. Well, um, do what well you, you you've you've kind of answered actually the next question oh. we had uh, which is uh, what what books do you turn to when oh. you re, uh, refill yourself spiritually so let me ask a different question about books um, is there a book of the Bible that you've never preached on uh, but that you kind of want to preach on oh, this is or scary. maybe that you are glad you've never preached on <laughs> Leviticus <laughs> <I'll> just... <laughs> No, love your neighbor as yourself is from Leviticus. So that's one of the big, I know, big keeps, themes of your book. It comes up in different ways, but I've never actually preached on it, like preached from it or uh, some of the some of the other details of it. But I was like, it's interesting because I I am an equal opportunity employer, even for <laughs> I really do believe that we could take any text and find some and do something with it. You uh, know that Rob Bell, when he started Mars Hills in Michigan preached through Leviticus for the first year? I have no, I had no idea. <laughs> yeah. What a, a, what a brave soul. <laughs> it's like, that's a, that's a lofty goal. Degree right of there. difficulty. My fellow former alum. <laughs> He's got a podcast about it. Oh, oh. Yeah, anyway. No, no, idea. no idea. But in it, for you though, uh, yeah, that any book, but is there any book that, that you haven't preached on the other than Leviticus? Do you know, honestly, I've never preached from Revelation. Mm -hmm. Wow. Ooh. Yes, <laughs> I have not. I have not. I just thought about that. I've not. I've Do you want to? <laughs> 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 Although I probably would, because I tend to go to the tougher text, right? So I realize that part of my work is to take on the tougher text or the text that feel feel too easy on surface or no one else wants to touch. So I do. I believe in that work. So maybe. Maybe, maybe in a year, I'll let you know what happened. <laughs> uh, yes, get, get, get back to us. Final uh, a set of lightning rounds, questions from Band at the Podcast, who has okay. been uh, very present in this podcast. I saw uh, him walking by a couple yeah, times. Yeah, he's, uh, he's been here. I um, think for your interest, Bandit, I saw him too. <laughs> so Bandit asks, what is your favorite animal and why is it a cat? Well, of course it's a cat because you're so doggone stealthy. <laughs> nice. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> and uh, Bandit also likes to know if you have a favorite bird. The ones that do not wake me up outside of my bedroom window every <laughs> single morning at 3 a.m. How do birds chirp at 3 a.m.? 
you've talked you you've talked about play uh, as a metaphor. So Bandit wonders, what's one one game that you could play endlessly without getting bored? Oh my goodness! Or toy? Yeah, you know, I'm going to show my hand. I'm a spades player. I love a good game of spades, cards, a <laughs> card nice. game. So I could play card games all day. <laughs> I could play card games all day. It's an old pastime. <laughs> nice. And Bandit also wonders, because he is quite good at this activity, where is the strangest place you've ever taken a nap? Now you're just asking me too many secrets because nap time <laughs> is my second ministry. So <laughs> I'm going to tell, I, it has to be probably in my car, probably in my car. I don't know. It's, I, I really do love a good nap. I love a good nap. Do not get enough, but I love a good nap. They're the best. Nap time is my second ministry might it's be the greatest line I've heard in a long time. <laughs> <laughs> so last question from bandit bandit wants to know what is your favorite meditative act, uh, uh, meditative activity oh i love doodling i'm a doodler i'm a drawer i'm a colorer so yes it kind of gets me in a different world well lisa this has been so wonderful to talk with you about your just terrific book preaching the headlines thank you for being with us on this episode it's been so great to be with you thank you Thanks for listening to this episode of Working Preacher Books podcast. Stay up to date on our conversation at workingpreacher.org. Follow us on Twitter or Facebook and find the latest in our Working Preacher book series at workingpreacher.org slash books. Thanks for joining us. Thank you all.